Today in Studio 4, cars, cigars, cabarets, and motorcycle adventures in Cuba. Yorkshire-born international travel writer, photographer, Christopher P. Baker, delves into Cuba's culture, its turbulent history, and offers us some fascinating sidebars on the mob, Castro, even Ernest Hemingway. Englishman Christopher P. Baker is a born wanderer who suffers from terminal travelitis and he writes fine tales in magazines and books about his adventures and observations around the globe. He has a fondness for Latin America and the Caribbean. His newest moon handbook exposes his vast Cuban knowledge. It is my pleasure to welcome Christopher Baker to Studio 4 to tell us more. Fanny, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. I, I suggest you suffer from terminal travelitis. Is it still true? It's true. I'm on the road about six months every year. How did you get into the biz of the travel writing biz? Well, I was a traveler, just kind of semi-professionally traveling, just bumming around, not knowing what I wanted to really do, but knowing that travel was, knowing that travel was in my blood. And um, I just fell into it, really. I, you know, when I settled in the USA, I landed a job in the adventure travel business, but was a frustrated writer. And, it, you know, I had the light bulb come on that told me, hey, I can mm -hmm. combine these two skills and desires. And your other skills, because apparently you have a master's degree in Latin America, American studies out of, out of Liverpool. London University, did you go to London U as I well? I did geography at London, and I did Latin American studies at Liverpool, yes. So it all came together. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Uh, and you've won awards now. UCAL Berkeley, you were at UCAL Berkeley as well? I got a scholarship to go to UC Berkeley. I never went to Berkeley to do journalism, but I got a scholarship to do so. I got waylaid by marriage. Oh, <laughs> you did waylaid, because I was reading in the cover of one of your many books, Mi Molto Fidel, and it says, it talks about three women, it says. And I don't know if it's true or it's just what it is. Like a knight errant cruising a sultry paradise, Baker finds fair ladies wherever he goes. <laughs> well, I wish, I wish that know? were true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly in Cuba. I mean, Cuba is amazing. It's uh, Caribbean communism, socialism, and sensuality. It's almost surreal. All combined. And the, the passion of an individual Cuban. What do you compare it to, can you? Well, certainly they're hot-blooded in many ways, mm. um, but they're a passionate people and a proud people. And this is what, why I love going to Cuba. It's an intense experience. It's full of eroticism, eccentricity, and enigma. It's just fantastic. Your first trip to Cuba, do you remember it well? I do remember it well, of course, yes, 1993. Mm. I came in on a boat from Jamaica. And? And uh, I went to Santiago, but more memorable for me was my first visit to Havana. That was uh, the following year, 1994. Uh, no, later in 93, arrived in Havana and discovered uh, this eccentric world. I mean, it's, it's haunting. Things happen on the streets of Havana that make me feel like I'm living inside a romantic thriller. I've got one anecdote I'd love to share with you. You, right? you share it now, uh, 90, About 1999, 2000, I had a girlfriend who was a dancer at the Tropicana Cabaret. This cabaret was launched in 1939. Mm. It's now in its seventh day, decade of what, stiletto healed paganism. Every night I'd pick her up at the show. One night I arrived and she'd shaved her head and she was dressed entirely in white. White turban, white clothes, right down to the shoes. She had these colorful um, necklaces and she had bangles of copper, etc. We took this 1953 Ford taxi through the back streets of Havana. Very dark, shady mood. A policeman leapt out in front of the taxi, stopped the taxi. There was a man at the side of the road, blood bleeding profusely. So the policeman wanted to commandeer the taxi and put the man in, take, it, take him to the hospital. Mercedes wound down the window, put a turbaned head out of the window and said, you can't do that. I'm Santa Teresa, the policeman who clearly believed in, in Santeria because she was dressed like this because she was being initiated into Santeria, the Af Afro-Cuban religion. Yes. Believing in Santeria, understanding what she meant by Santa Teresa, said, go, get out of here. And he went off to, to look for another car and I said to her, what happened? She said, I told him I'm Santa Teresa, the patron saint of the dead. Had he put that man in the car, I would have killed him. 
I had to wonder what my, the rest of my evening had in store. Exactly, and <laughs> dare I ask. It's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read this one, but I've certainly enjoyed Cuba, uh, the Moon Handbook. Uh, I think of Havana, I think of the cult of Hemingway. Oh, absolutely. Don't know why, just do. Um, you know, when you walk through the cobbled streets and plazas of Havana, you feel Ernest Hemingway walking beside you. Fishing Marlin, I bet he was, off the coast, doing a lot of that. And drinking, of course. Um, of his course. two famous bars. He had a, a phrase, mi mojito en la bodeguita del medio, which is a bar. My daiquiri in uh, La Floridita, that's another bar. They're still there. They still worship him. You go into the Floridita these days, and there is a life-sized statue of Hemingway by the bar. What was his connection to Cuba, do you think, in his heart? Oh, he... I mean, we know he was connected to Idaho, but what was his connection to he Cuba. loved the passions that exist in Cuba, the profundity of the people. They're wonderfully profound people, and he understood that, and he related to that. He, he related to their sensualism. Mm -hmm. He bought a home there that's now the Museum Hemingway. He lived there for 20 years. It became his primary residence. I remember that from History 101, I think, but now you've confirmed it. Mm -hmm. uh, Castro, uh, Hemingway met Castro, of course. They met one time. You met and Castro. I met Castro in 2003, yes. What yes. was that like? Well, it was fascinating because obviously I'd wanted to meet Fidel for so long. I'd been close to him several times. And in fact, when I was trying to get the motorcycle to Cuba, I got an invitation to meet him and he never showed at the meeting. But in 2003, it was fascinating to witness the way this man worked that room and he worked it. I was with a group of about 40 people that the Cuban government had flown in from Mexico for a one-day visit to Havana. And we were a, a spectrum of people. Obviously, mm -hmm. I had no idea what their political opinions were, but I can only guess from, you know, the full spectrum was there. He worked that crowd, and within five minutes, by humor, he had got everybody enraptured with him. He's a charismatic man. It, it, they say so. Uh, he, he doesn't dislike, you say, in uh, the handbook, he doesn't dislike individual Americans. He hates the imperialist idea. Exactly. But That's he's not against, he certainly has American friends. Many of his friends are key, key individuals, members of the Rockefeller family. Ted Turner, personally known to him, friends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's no, puzzling, it's, isn't it? And, and that's the way the Cubans are. They love Americans, but they understand there's a difference between Americans and American policy. Mm. And, you know, Castro got this. Castro sees himself as the heir to Jose Marti. Jose Marti was the 19th century nationalist hero who led um, Cuba's independence from Spain. Fidel sees himself as the heir to Jose Marti. Jose Marti had said, when this war of independence is over, it will be my ambition to prevent the USA taking the island of Cuba, basically. And Fidel wrote the same thing before the revolution succeeded. So he sees himself as an anti-imperialist. When the US slammed the door on Cuba, however, wasn't looking good when the revolution really slammed the door on Cuba. Oh, well, true, of course. And what a change we had. And the USA is still struggling five decades later to understand how to relate to, to Cuba. Day-to-day -day life in Cuba for uh, a Cuban worker today. Well, it varies. Um, the average wage for a Cuban is about $14, so most people struggle. The black market is how most people get by. I mean, the state provides uh, rations, etc. But with such low wages, there's no way that most Cubans can get by. So the black market is the biggest part of the economy, and they struggle. They struggle, quite frankly. If you tip someone, be it in a five-star hotel or a small hotel, you should probably tip big, I would suggest. Well, the Cuban workers who enter tourism, and that's a lot of people wanting to mm -hmm. enter tourism, I do so because they have access to tips. I mean, if you, if you are a Cuban, you, you want to buy toilet paper or toothpaste, you better have access to foreign currency. Uh, and the only way to really do that, if you don't have family in, in Florida, for example, is to work within the tourism industry. So yeah, tip, 